Thank you very much for that video and congratulations again to our 2019 International River Prize or the 20th um, International River, River, River Prize. So I'm assuming everyone would have been in the dinner last night, if not most, and that was good fun, right? Cool. We'll, have another, we'll, we'll be having another fun keynote today. It's actually um, very appropriate to follow um, after such a good night last night. Um, it is our second to the last keynote. Uh, we will still have a, one more keynote for the closing. So the keynote for today is called Basin Bookends, a river community perspective on the road to resilient rivers. Now, um, we call this as an interactive keynote. Originally, we planned it as one after the other, but I think you will agree with me later on, and I hope you will, and they'll prove themselves, that together, they're actually better than one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, with that, I will be, I'll just pull out, the, uh, bear with me, I'll just pull out the, um, I should be able to operate this from the arrows, I am assuming. So, just very quickly, I'll give a, a, a very brief context of where we are. So in Australia, uh, for, for our international uh, delegates, we are faced with a number, of our, a number of challenges. Our rivers are faced with a number of challenges. So for example, when you look at a map of Australia here, the first one, Australia is a very dry continent. So most of Australia um, is basically desert. So you have only the arable or the livable parts of Australia in the fringes. So, um, but what we have done in the last, in the last few decades is we've actually um, changed the, 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 the landscape of Australia. We've changed it in such a way we've built dams and weirs, and mainly because we have low and variable flows, just because of the dry nature of Australia. And, and, and as such, we've had, um, and coupled with intensive land use, we've also then um, dumped a lot of sediments and nutrients into, our, in, into our, our rivers and our waterways. So the conditions of our rivers have declined below a level that community considers satisfactory. So what are the challenges we're facing, which, which other countries are similarly facing? Floods and droughts, increase in floods and droughts. We aim for water security, of course, as a dry continent. We aim for food security, and I'd like to acknowledge what Stuart has always, and Stuart is here as one of our Changemaker, Changemaker panel members, that what we always forget is we aim for food security and water security, but we, for, we forget about the ecosystem, which is basically the ecological crisis. And in that ecosystem, of course, are embedded the people. I always like this photo, and I keep on putting it up, because the activist is not the man who says the river is dirty but it's actually the man who cleans up the river. And that's actually very appropriate for today's keynote speakers. Just very briefly, you've seen this slide before, the context that we need to look at our rivers and catchments from a whole holistic point of view, from a whole of system point of view. Because the challenge we will be facing is always the connection between upstream and downstream. So we have and especially in larger river basins, transboundary river basins, it's always about the tension between upstream and downstream. And with that, I'm a riverland irrigator. I've been going through water reform for over 40 years. In that 40 years, we've seen our open channels converted to pressurized piping systems. We've reduced our water losses. We've taken up sensible, efficient, and newest technologies in irrigation. We've expanded our footprint with using less water. South Australia capped our extractions on water use back in 1968, and none of the other states did until 1996, and by then it was too late. All we want as a South Australian irrigation community is security of supply to do what we do best, which is produce good produce. I'm a Queensland cotton grower. Queensland was late to this irrigation development scenario. 
And I've just spent millions of dollars building infrastructure so that I can harvest the water that flows across my land to grow a crop that produces economic benefits for my community and my family. I'm a dairy farm from Lake Alexandrina, right at the bottom of the system. My farm sits between Lake Albert and Lake Alexandrina, and I grew up on the Coorong. I don't understand why people think that this is an expendable part of our landscape. I watched during the millennium drought our dairy industry evaporate in front of my eyes. We saw families walking off their farms. We saw pe people who had to make really tough decisions to change the way that they did business because of the millennium drought. I just want a fair go too, and I want the end of the river system to have a fair go. And that means the Coorong needs fresh water. You can't have fresh water in the Coorong if you remove the barrages, flood it with seawater, and not return the over 60% of the water that's being extracted upstream. You'll end up with a dead sea and a disconnection of the Coorong to fresh water flows. Do we want to be held up as a nation, as the nation that destroyed the Coorong, that destroyed the very habitat that creates an amazing ecological wonder at the end of our river system? Do we really want to be that people? I'm a floodplain grazier and my family's been here for five generations. Look at the water we've got on this floodplain. Look at what it does for our productivity. I just don't understand why government keeps giving our water to irrigators and now they want to give it to South Australia? <laughs> I'm a Coorong fisherman. My, I'm fourth generation Coorong fisherman. And I've seen this fishery change dramatically from when my great-great-grandfather first fished these waters. It was largely a freshwater fishery. The Coorong was bountiful. We've now seen our fishery reduced to almost nothing. The Coorong was the lifeblood of a range of economic activity around fishing. It's not anymore. Is that fair? Is that fair that people upstream should have that right to take that away from us? Is that really fair? I'm a traditional owner. My mob's been here for thousands and thousands of years. I just really don't understand why those white fellas are not talking to us about the water. Surely, surely we have. I'd like to interrupt there, and I know this is a surprise for you. Um, that's a cue for me to actually acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today, the Yagara and the Turbo people. I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. And with that, I hand over to the keynote speakers. I'm a houseboat owner. I run a small business. It's dependent upon tourism. It's dependent upon a healthy river system. Why do people keep talking the river down? It's beautiful. We need to, to support tourism within our communities, within our, within our regions. And how can we do that if we keep telling people the river's dying? The river's in trouble. It needs better management. But it's, it, it is also an extremely beautiful place. And how do you reconcile that? How do you get tourists to come to a place where we keep telling them the river's dying? I'm the mayor of a small community on the river and our river's really healthy and my community depends on the water that we've got. We can't afford to give our water to anyone else. Why should we when we've looked after our patch? I'm just a citizen living on the river in South Australia and I care about our environment. I spend our holidays and our weekends camping in what used to be beautiful, pristine environments. 20 years leading up to the millennium drought, we had a man-man drought, where we increased the capacity to take the minor floods out of the river system upstream, and the, the overbank events down in South Australia just disappeared completely. Those minor floods that kept our beautiful environment either side of the river healthy, they were gone. Then we had the Millennium Drought. And we saw 
thousands of hectares of what were previously beautiful red gum floodplains dying, dying before our eyes. And we were faced with a very, very real prospect that we were going to hand on our environment in a worse situation to our children than we received it from our parents. I'm a Queenslander and I've been told by people who use water here that we need our water, that less than, we provide less than 5% of the flow in South Australia. So how can we impact on South Australia? And I don't know anyone down there. But the other thing that I've heard is that you know, that Adelaide city, it's not even on the river. They steal our water. I'm a South Australian and we need our water too. We just do. All of our communities depend upon it. And we can't understand why people upstream don't see that we need to have a fair and proper sharing of water from one end of the system to the other. Not only just for us as people, but for the ecosystems. How do we sustain ecosystems if we don't share the water properly? I don't know anyone in Queensland except Leith. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that we only take 7% of the water out of the system for extractive uses and that we capped back in 1968 to 72 and everyone else continued to rape and pillage. How is that fair? Must be Victoria and New South Wales that caused the problem, Helen. <laughs> I noticed their absence here today, Lise. <laughs> Just the way it is. But the Narran Lakes are really important. They're much more important than the Pural because that's where I go to go camping and enjoy the out outdoors with my family. Leith, you need to come down to the Pural because that's not the case. There's beauty at the top, there's beauty at the bottom. And if we're not careful, we're going to destroy both. Fellow delegates, colleagues and friends, we are now, you've heard two contrasting versions of upstream, downstream demands and desires. We basically, what we have now in most river systems is an upstream, downstream standoff. I am very privileged to be in the middle, well, in the middle of these two amazing women. Both are chairs of a boards, uh, Leith with Sunwater, Carleen with Ice Warm. Um, so we will continue on this standoff. So what you have found, what we have observed, are basically competing demands, upstream, downstream, and, and especially when we look at the bigger river systems, transboundary rivers, the Yangtze, for example, um, the Danube, this becomes more stressful. But who speaks for our rivers? Who gives our, our rivers a voice? And of course, the common factor in all of these, through, through Leeds and Carleen's weave of stories, it's about people. It's about people connecting with our rivers. And because everyone, all of us, actually live in a basin. We're working in a, a vested interest collision space. We do have communities of interest upstream and downstream. We've got irrigators upstream and downstream. There's no homogenisation of an irrigator. They have different views depending on where they stand in the river. We've got property developers who want to take more and more and more, and the water views are what people are looking for. We've got future jobs, 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 jobs. Everybody's talking about jobs and economic development. Across the world, we've got urbanisation, which is leading to all sorts of unplanned development, which is causing all sorts of stresses and pressures on our water systems. We throw into that mix that we have droughts and floods and, and terrible hardship for communities that are having to deal with these changes. We have pressure groups from afar who think they know they're right and think that they should impose their altruistic views on the rest of society. And then in amongst all of that, we have the poor old environment which seems to take back seat without a voice of its own. And all of this collides in the Minister's office. All of it. And we expect that politicians should be able to make sense of all of this and come up with the answer that is right for us. 
Common sense is a term that I have used, heard used over and over and over again. And my response to that is common sense according to the irrigators, the unplanned, people living in unplanned development, the communities of interest, the property developers, those that want future jobs. Whose common interest or whose common sense is the right common sense? And how do you sort out the difficulty of all those vested interests colliding in the Minister's office? So if only our scientists could get it together before they got to the Minister's office. We've got environmental science, We've got engineering, we've got social science, we've got political science, the humanities. The list goes on and on. Do these people work together to a common interest? No. So how do we work out who's right? Then throw into that the industry demands. Industry demands in communities, industry demands with local government, industry demands on state governments, industry demands on federal governments. Major irrigation development. Developing the north. Build more dams. Let's have a water grid. Another one. Mining. Let's dig up as much coal as we can. Hydropower. We need the new wave of energy. Hydropower. How's that going to impact on water? What does that mean for flow patterns in rivers? What about steelworks? What about industry sector? Grow, 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 grow in the world. What about those future jobs? We all want those future jobs. And we, we don't even know what those future jobs are yet. There's going to be more and more of those. So constantly there's a drive in all policy areas across government about what about the jobs that come first before everything. So it's no wonder the community's confused. The minister's office has got all of these vested interests. The scientists can't present a coherent answer. And what happens when you get confusion? People become afraid. They don't know who to trust. And so they protest. And conflict breaks out in our communities. In the Murray-Darling Basin, we saw the burning of the books in Griffith. That wasn't done by people who aren't good people. That was done by people who were terrified for themselves and their children. Every now and then, you get someone like Peter Cullen, who's unfortunately not with us anymore, who's able to cut through that and gain the trust of those communities. And we might talk a little bit more about how he did that as we summarise. The question is, who's listening? The question more is how do we solve all of these? The conflicting interests, the conflicting demands, the conflicting desires, and as Leith has indicated, the conflicting passion from the community just because there's so much information around and decisions sometimes are made without consideration of a coherent piece of information. But the first thing that we have to recognise in any reform journey is that there's going to be winners and losers if we pretend that everyone can get a fair go without some sort of mechanisms put in place, then we're kidding ourselves. In these debates, everything should be contested, whether it's environmental values, personal values, existing rights, the law, the institutions that we have, everything's up for grabs because we need to get the best outcome for the rivers, for our, our political system and for our communities. To achieve sufficient consensus to change, there's a few things that have emerged from the, the journeys that Carleen and I have, have been on that, that jump out really clearly. And if we, if we adhere to, to these sorts of processes, we can get to good outcomes. So we need information provided to all of the stakeholders, whether you be a minister, a public servant, an irrigator, or a member of the community. 
You need to take that knowledge and you need to rationalise it in your context to turn it into knowledge. You need to have forums where we can talk and talk and talk until the talking starts. Let's learn something from the Indigenous people who looked after this country for, for thousands and thousands of years. Until they understood and trusted, they didn't move on. That's something that we can also do. We need to commit to jointly working together, whether you're a decision maker or the mayor or a member of a community, we can jointly discover solutions to the problems that we have. If we've got the tools to be able to then evaluate what those solutions might do in terms of creating winners and losers, then we can talk about what do we need to put in place to make sure that the losers are compensated. And in the Murray-Darling Basin, there's a couple of really important mechanisms that were put in place to do just that. First one was the creation of water entitlements that became a property right and the creation of a water market to allow those to be traded. So you could share across the basin um, that precious water resource. The second was the commitment of government to buy some of those entitlements to give back to the environment. So the environment benefited, the irrigators weren't losers, they received capital in exchange for their water. But more than anything else, we, we need leadership from the community, from industry, from the science community, from our political leaders. Everyone needs to stand for something. They need to stand for our people. And if they stand for our people, our rivers will be resilient. And leadership is the key. And it's not just leadership from one level. It's not the politicians that need to lead. It's the leaders in each and every one of you. It's the leaders in every community that need to expand their thinking beyond, beyond what's in it for me. Leadership is not about running out ahead, you know, the buffalo that charges ahead and leaves the herd behind. It's about leading from behind and taking the herd along, losing some along the way, granted, but keeping the majority moving in the same direction. And leadership requires a buy-in at the different levels from the different disciplines, from the different organisations. And I think that that, that that is something that we're not actually achieving across the globe very well at the moment. Lee talked about the winners and the losers. And from my experience in the Murray-Darling Basin reforms, I know that the social aspects are just as important as the economic aspects, as are the environmental aspects. You look at industry, you look at communities, you look at regional development, and you can't have a major policy reform the size of the Murray-Darling Basin without having some unintended consequences. And you can't have just a water focus on that reform agenda. You must have a regional development and transition focus for the communities that are most affected by this, by this um, reform journey that we're on. And I think some of the areas where we've actually not supported well is where we're seeing all of the blowback at the moment and the slippage, the backsliding, is where we haven't taken those communities along for the journey and they're feeling marginalised and left out of the process. Water reform cuts through so many different policy areas. We need to have sustainable environmental management, but we also need to have sustainable industry development. We need to grow. We need sustainable economies to underpin our regions and we need those regions to be really ticking along to be able to afford to be good to the environment. And we also need towns and cities as more people are moving into towns and cities around the globe and the urbanisation of our populations. And if we leave those people behind and we don't have an engagement with the, with the environment that they're leaving behind, who's going to look after Water reform requires a multidisciplinary approach and it requires bringing people together. But more important, it also requires a transdisciplinary thinking. It means engineers have to get out of their isolation in an engineering world and start looking at social issues. It means social, social sciences, scientists need to start to engage with the environmentalists and the engineers to work out what's the best solution in a particular environment and a particular community. 
We need to reform the way we think about reform. Sounds easy. The answers are, are within reach, but, but we must we understand, understand what it's, what it's like, like to walk in others' shoes. We have, have a, a global, global challenge requiring global solutions and we need to reach beyond, beyond our, our comfort zone. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. I hope you agree with me. These are two amazing, passionate women. And once again, I'm very humbled to be able to facilitate that interactive keynote. Thank you very much, Colleen and Lee. Thank you. So to follow on that interactive keynote, we've, through Natalie, Natalie has actually, I would like to acknowledge Natalie from my team on this one, um, has put together what we call as a river community change maker panel. And I'd like to call them up on stage. Professor Stuart Bunn from Griffith University, representing the science sector. Brad Mogridge, representing the cultural sector. Walter Kling, from Vienna Water, Austria, representing the industry sector. And last, we have Nguyen Phung, from Vietnam, representing the government sector. And our two keynotes will, will stand on the side, but they will be reacting where it's relevant. We do have some set of questions that we have put forth to the Changemaker panel members. But yeah, can I please start with perhaps very quickly getting some feedback from each of you representing the different sectors on what you just heard. Can I start with Stuart, please? No pressure, Eva. What I've just heard, I mean, that, this, this is a debate that plays out everywhere around the world. Um, and, you know, I think the key message for me is that there is no easy solution. And I'd certainly reinforce the view that, you know, the only way to, to move and advance in these discussions is about understanding other people's views, respecting their views. I mean, a lot of it's to do with respect. Uh, and that's something that I think is missing in the debate um, today. Thanks, Stuart. Brad? Uh, first, I acknowledge the country. Uh, thank the Jagara and the Turrbal people for having us here. And thanks for allowing me to be here as well. Um, thanks, ladies. That was, that was a great debate. And um, I'm glad we got a mention. <laughs> it's, always, it's rare, but we got a mention um, as you know, having 3,250 generations of knowledge, 65,000 years, but we don't have a say in water. Um, I suppose that's one of the things is we haven't had the opportunity to put our bit forward. We're never at the table, we're never in the room, we're down the street. Uh, and I suppose that's, that's a challenge that um, science has, that's a challenge the government has, and I think if we had a voice or an opportunity to put our point forward, you know, we might have some solutions, um, but at the moment we don't have that opportunity to put forward those solutions. So I think, it, as Stuart sort of mentioned, uh, and um, it, it is a massive challenge when you've got multi-jurisdictional, and I suppose Indigenous Australia, you know, there's, there's the challenge of 250 language groups. There's not one common language. We're not all just Indigenous. We're all our own people. And I suppose that is a challenge to get us to the table, but when you're on our country, on our river, on our groundwater, I think we need to be at the table. Um, there's, a, there's an opportunity there, so thanks. Walter. Well, ladies, thanks for this uh, very impressive uh, presentation. And I've seen that I have to play a role as the industry, which makes me not uh, very comfortable as I am a water <laughs> supplier. And I think as a water supplier, you would think that you service the people in a substantial need of their life. So it's not a thing where you say, well, I should be criticized on that. 
also serving customers which uh, use water for economic purposes, for those things which we need in uh, living in uh, urban areas. Uh, I think the essence of, of what you brought, of the thoughts you brought to us is there are winners and losers in, uh, in, in this kind of discussion which need to take place. And uh, the tricky thing is uh, nobody wants to be a loser. So uh, I'm not sure when I go back to Austria whether I leave Brisbane depressed or <laughs> with a sense of, of optimism. I might even add some, uh, a critical thought, which I, well, you, you're living here in Australia, and I would call it a very tricky, a very challenging environment, but I can also add something to the discussion which we have in the Danube region, and this is beside the situation in each of the countries which we have in the uh, Danube River Basin, we have 19 countries which share this basin. And they have different economic systems, they have different social environment, they've been former East Bloc countries versus the Western European countries. So you can even uh, create even more, well, more discussions and more winners and losers and uh, I think also one, one of the points of discussion we will have is will people take water as a source where we think uh, this is a, a backbone of a society and built on the discussion we start where, by dealing with water, uh, we can also solve other discussions of our society or in our countries because uh, I would not recommend to shift, if I'm a loser in the environmental cause, to shift to any other theme like uh, urban areas or uh, social care or uh, uh, health care, etc. Well, then I shift from, from uh, one part being a loser to then I want to win the other game uh, which need to be discussed. So don't, don't trade problems. But let's probably uh, acknowledge that water is definitely a kind of base or backbone of our society which built essential discussions. And uh, the water services are part of that. Thanks, Walter. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Phuong from uh, Vietnam National Mekong Committee. Um, I'm from the Mekong River Basin. So, uh, um, I'm very impressed with the presentation uh, uh, because uh, the Mekong River, uh, we learn a lot from the Murray Darling experiences and lessons learned, and we keep going, keep learning from Murray Darling. So, the most important uh, or the most impressed um, point that I learned is uh, in the game we have winner, winner and loser. Sometimes we, we talk about win-win solution, but I think it's very difficult, very hard, very challenging to get that win-win solution. So we have winner and we have loser. So how we can, the winner can not so be proud of uh, in front of the, uh, uh, the sadness of the loser, or how the loser can be compensated. That is very important. And in the Mekong River Basin, we are now uh, trying to find the way to, to harmonize, to balance between winning and losing. And we have a lot of development in the Mekong River Basin now. So uh, what we learned uh, from the Murray Darling, what we learned from other river basins in the world is very, very, very important, very crucial for us. Thank you. Thanks, Fong. Um, any reaction from our keynote speakers on this one? Yes, I, I think um, the observation around winners and losers is a critical one and the importance of having parallel programs that actually are not based on the environment but are based on people uh, and to bring together the agencies that are responsible for the economics of regions and, and to build programs that support transition in major reform is absolutely crucial to bring communities along with you. And as Lise said in her presentation, communities are confused. Communities are looking at it from their own perspective. I can tell where someone's from in the Murray-Darling Basin by how they talk about water. And the thing is, is that people are looking at it through a very narrow lens and we're not, able, and we're not enabling them to look broader and bigger. And unless we have an investment in that capacity development 
and that investment in the rural um, parallel programs to support transition towards reform, um, we will start to see backsliding and we will start to see um, the outcomes not what we would like to see. So, Carleen actually highlighted something and, and, and Leith um, started with that thinking and I, I, this is probably more a question to Stuart. Uh, from a science perspective, the concept of conflicting science or the challenge of conflicting science. How do you think, what are the mechanisms by which we could strengthen the science, get rid of this conflict and um, not make the communi community as confused as they are now? Um, thanks, Eva. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things I think as a scientist is that, you know, science is based on a whole premise of being wrong and, and having an opposing view. So um, what scientists like to do is argue about um, the work that they're doing and that passes as normal activity for scientists. Um, but it doesn't play out well in the public arena. So um, a lot of what we see in terms of why the public, I can, you know, it's understandable why the public get confused when scientists are arguing with each other over, you know, key parts of the work that they're doing um, and not really understanding that that's a, that's a sign of a healthy scientific process of, you know, challenge and dispute. What it tends to be confused as, as, you know, the scientists don't agree, so we'll choose the information that uh, most suits the view that I already have. It's almost, uh, you know, so what we're seeing playing out, and I think the media have a key role in this too, mm -hmm. is that the debate is that the public are getting a mi mix of different views. It's very hard to, to sort out what the process is, uh, you know, what the, the consensus view, if you like. And I think a lot of that science debate, one of the ways that I'm certainly, um, you know, I think works really well is for scientists shouldn't be having these debates in the popular press, you know, that it doesn't play out well. I mean, if there are um, uncertainties and there are, there is a need for, you know, scientific debate, have those debates um, amongst your own community, look to see what the consensus view is and reach those sorts of views. I think it, it, we're doing ourselves a great disservice by thinking we're going to, you know, uh, it helped the debate along by slinging off at each other in uh, the popular press. That's right, thank you. Brad, uh, you talked about um, recognition of Indigenous science as well, and I, 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 like you, I love that slide because there's a lot of knowledge there um, from the Indigenous community as well as from the farmers themselves, from people who actually are faced with the land day to day. Um, how, how do you think, or what do you think is a role from a minority, you said minority, you talk about, you know, we are, we are a number, but we are also disparate within ourselves. What are the mechanisms by which we will also have what we call of, uh, what we kind of refer to as a community consensus from a, from a cultural perspective? That's a tough one. And it's, it is. Um, I've had time to think about it, but I think it's, um, it's a massive one because you know the I think the um, well the, the fish kills was a great example, mm -hmm. and we saw two independent science panels looking mm. at the same set of data. Um, these these are the fish kills recently in, in um, the, the Darling River and in Western New South Wales, and you know all I saw was whiteness. Mm. <laughs> um, and I, I think they you know the, the academy tried its best. Mm. Um, in their review, you know, they, they had Uncle Badger there talking about his, his, his connection to his river. Mm -hmm. But I think we're not... Indigenous science is not, not there yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we... we um, validation, I don't like that word of Indigenous science. You know, Indigenous knowledge is proven already. You know, we've lived on the dry, mm -hmm. and have to con on Earth for thousands of generations. We've adapted to climate change. We've adapted to sea level rise. We've adapted to droughts. And I think it's that, that bit of testing and observation is, is a science, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not, um, I don't think we should have to validate it. It's because mm -hmm. it, we've survived. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think the other, the other challenge is that when we look at what credible evidence is there, you know, a lot of our histories and knowledge is, is, is oral as well. And I think when we tell our stories, it's not myth and legend. It's actually 
a science. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that bit is, is the culture of science needs to change as well and needs to adapt to, to, to be a bit more flexible in, in the way science is dealt with, you know. We're, we're, we're just the same as scientists, you know. We, we argue amongst ourselves, and, but what we do is we, we care for that country, we care for that river, we don't do anything to that river that's going to affect anyone downstream and we're going to leave generations water in a better state than we, let, than we, than we got it. Yeah. So I suppose that, and that's the other challenge is, is leadership in our communities. You know, we've all, because we're so diverse, that other issue is, um, is a challenge for us because, you know, we, we look at Indigenous leaders, you know, they should be only leading their own community. You know, it's like, you know what, you know, Germany's not going to talk for Austria, you know, same, mm -hmm. same scenario. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about the war. <laughs> the, <laughs> Victoria and Queensland, yeah. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to have those challenges of, of um, you know, cross-border issue, cross issues and, you know, rivers don't discriminate mm -hmm. when they cross borders. Mm -hmm. Aboriginal people's connection to country doesn't look at borders. Yeah. You know, when governments deal with rivers, you know, that because of the way we've set up here in Australia, you know, that, that their services stop at the border or, or that that river's management stops at the border. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if the role of, I think, um, communities as well is that that voice is important as well. So that it's having the opportunity to have, have a say, and I think me being on stage is a great opportunity. You know, I, I get to, to, to have a say, and it's, um, it's like therapy, really. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling good. <laughs> but I suppose the other challenge is we don't have an um, advisory body at any, at any level. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a research centre that governments can go to and ask for some mm -hmm. Indigenous science. And I suppose there's, there's gaps out there that, you know, that we've been talking about for many years, and... You know, there's that credible evidence needs to be put forward and the best available science, and that would include Indigenous science. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brad. Th that, that is, um, when we were talking about this, we were planning this keynote with these amazing ladies, we talked about stories and how important stories are. Um, can I get a comment from Lee? Thanks, Lee. Um, I, I wonder whether we're using all of the wrong language around how we deal with science. All science is, is knowledge. Mm -hmm. Brad has knowledge, Carleen has knowledge, Eva has knowledge. Why can't we sit down around the table and share that knowledge, determine what it is we agree on and what we disagree on? And in all of the processes I've been involved in, you find that people agree on 80%. Mm -hmm. So there's only a little bit really around the edges that you don't agree on. So can't we set that aside and take it as sufficient consensus to move forward? But I also wanted to comment a little bit in response to Brad. You know, it really worries me in 2019 that we're still sufficiently racist, that we don't bring Indigenous people to the table in their own right as equals. So what are we doing, folks? Where's the leadership from all of us? Can I just add in a small way to that? But imagine being a minister at the bottom end of the system during the millennium drought with 117 years of data, observations, that were feeding into modelling that was predicting what the future might look like and the future gave us something completely different. Imagine if our observations were 65,000 years and we didn't just use white man's data. There's definitely a very <coughs> serious food for thought for all of us and that concept of minority groups and the knowledge that they have is probably not just unique in Australia and you'll agree with me, it's actually around the world which takes me to a question to Fung from the Mekong River Basin, um, a very big transboundary uh, basin, different governments, different communities. You have minority groups, different objects, objectives and different visions. Um, any comment from you, Fung, on this one? Um, yeah, it's, it's very challenging uh, for the Mekong River Basin uh, because uh, we have um, 
for the Mekong, we have six countries sharing the water. Uh, but uh, in the lower Mekong, we have four member countries uh, uh, of the Mekong River Commission. Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we have very different situation. We have different contexts. We have different development agenda and objectives. So um, Vietnam, we, uh, we are uh, in the most downstream of the Mekong River. Uh, uh, the Mekong Delta of Vietnam are uh, facing a lot of uh, issues. Uh, uh, regarding uh, like a uh, salinity issue, intrusion, uh, uh, water pollution, um, sinking of the delta, and um, a lot of things, and also climate change impacts. And um, the local people, they are very um, worried about um, uh, the impacts itself in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam, but also the impacts from upstream development. So um, the government of Vietnam is, is very challenging for us because uh, we have to take into account the concern from the local, local people and also take into account the, um, the interest, the demand for development from the upstream countries. So how we can like, um, balance uh, the, the needs, balance the, the uh, let's say, a kind of conflicting needs and demands and interests very difficult, very challenged. So we like um, we have to do something. Uh, first, we have to have the evidence um, regarding the impacts of the development. If development take place upstream, uh, what are the impacts downstream for downstream? What are the evidence of that impacts? So we need a lot of uh, like a scientific scientific. Uh, evidences we have a lot need a lot of anal analysis uh, regarding the impacts, and we also have to like uh, consult with the local people. So we have we have to share the information. We have to share um, uh, the the facts, the findings to the local people, and uh, let them um, feedback. Let them uh, uh, tell us what they are thinking. And sometimes we have to get, go to, to down, down to the field and to see uh, by our, our own eyes uh, on what is going on at, at downstream, at, at, at the ground, on the ground. So uh, it's very, very challenging for us, for the government, to take into account uh, all the different views from different uh, stakeholders, different people, in order to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, make the final decision on any um, uh, 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 anything that relating to it, the, the development. Thank Thanks, you. Fong. Walter, you're not off the hook yet because industry is not off the hook, as we are all <coughs> always talked about. Um, my question, I guess, is I know there is, at the end, a, a bottom line objective for industry, which is, of course, associated with, with dollars, right? Where do you see the role of industry in this paradigm shift to actually address the challenges that we talked about today, um, getting the community on side, uh, ensuring that we have at least a, a, at least a, a consensus of science, um, recognizing that the minority groups, the cultural minorities, whether it's our um, indig indigenous people here or other cultural minorities in other countries, where do you see industry play a role in all of these? What Hard question, I, I know. Probably, <laughs> probably out of out of my view, I would say uh, uh, I have no answer on this uh, on this particular question. But uh, let me probably refer because the discussion we are having here is is not only uh, the the, the se uh, several roles which we represent, uh, but uh, really to answer the question: How do we get out of this situation? Mm -hmm. And uh, having been here now uh, two days listening to the stories I heard, I, I start with, with uh, the story of the Mercy River, the, the first winner. And uh, th this was a story we heard yesterday. It, it was recalled again. It takes 35 years to get out of the mess. And we heard about uh, the story from, from India, uh, where the story was also you need to continue, continuously try uh, to, to solve the problems, to involve the community, and you see the outcome after decades of your, of your work. 
And uh, I see this as a kind of uh, relation, uh, sorry, uh, responsibility on, on, on the side of the, the water suppliers or, or even the industry to work on the positive things are innovation. Mm -hmm. This is getting uh, knowledge from science into practical solutions, uh, which we can work on. I think the way the society today behaves in, in uh, saving water in the daily use uh, was not comparable to when I started in the business 30 years ago. There we were cooling the beer with flowing water just to get it uh, in, on, on a proper temperature. And my kids would never allow me that. Uh, anymore. So, but uh, I think this uh, this shouldn't be uh, uh, quick answers. Uh, I'm a bit lost if we really go to the uh, to uh, I think what what also Mara Ban uh, in in her keynote gave us about this this uh, way of uh, uh, acknowledging that we are dealing with a very uh, complex situation. And we need to find solutions uh, for that. And I think we are a little bit in this in this uh, world between uh, we have information and we have solutions in in the thousands of a second by the press of a button. And we realize that uh, mm -hmm. the achievement which we need to do for the environment need to take de uh, mm -hmm. decades to make this change. And I think this is. Uh, one of these essential points uh, of the discussion. So, if I were a politician, I would, I would go out of this room, send a Twitter message, and say it's all fake news, <laughs> uh, and hope that most of the people will follow me. And uh, but I think this is something which causes us a laugh at the moment, but it it also shows how serious this question is sometimes to, to, to see uh, this long way of development and to work for it. And, and the examples of the river prices you give is uh, one of those uh, examples where you see it needs really lifetime commitments of people to work on these issues uh, to make a change. And I think the industry in a positive way plays their role to do it. Uh, I just wanted to refer to what I heard before that we should get on, uh, together on the table and talk uh, through things. I think one of the problems I realized that everybody sits on his own table, <laughs> waiting the others to come on his table to speak about things. <laughs> and we continuously are sitting lonely on our table and said, why is nobody joining me? And I think this is something uh, what we probably need to overcome. And those examples which we hear about the river basins here is that uh, the people had overcome this situation, moved to the other tables, and that let's really sit around, discuss this. And the industry is definitely a partner in doing this and, and achieving good urban areas. If I'm a little bit depressive, I say also if I go to Africa, if I see the growth of Nairobi, with 60 million people, I really have no solution how we cope with that compared to this, well, uh, uh, di discussions which we have here. So I always reminded that each of the solutions we are creating fits only to the environment where we are at the moment, mm -hmm. on the table we are discussing, and we cannot easily uh, shift this to other tables and then take it as a common solution. So keep this in mind as well. Well done. You did say you were not going to answer, but you did answer it in such a way. I think the concept of industry taking on the knowledge from the science, the innovation in there, industry will have that capacity, either the, the technical capacity or the financial capacity, to actually evolve some discoveries from a university then for the good of the people, to hand it over for the good of the people. I, I go back to, to, to one of the slides that our keynotes have actually put forth. At the end of the day, the common factor is people. And um, I would like to get a little bit more comment from our, from our uh, keynotes on that one. The role of people, whether you're a scientist, whether you're an industry, whether you're an indigenous uh, representative, whether you're the, the kids out there in the school, for example, um, or the minister that Colleen has been talking about. 
I'd just like to say I can't agree with you more. Everyone sits at their table waiting for someone else to come to their table and what we need to be doing is creating new tables and we need to be going to those tables with an open mind and not a preconceived position on what we want out of that, that meeting. The only way you get solutions is when collectively people get together and, real, and become overwhelmed by the size of the problem first and foremost and then start a discussion that enables you to eat the elephant one bite at a time. And if you don't do that, and you come to those discussions expecting to get your own way, and you're the only one who's got it right, that's not a discussion. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster. So it's about creating those new tables that enable people to come together around those tables, and it's bringing the open mind to the table, and bringing your expertise and your experience as some information to feed into that thinking, but not to be the ultimate solution. I think retaining an open mind and being prepared to sit at anyone's kitchen table is, is what's important. H historically, um, decisions were made by scientists, sorry, by public servants in consultation with scientists and given to ministers to announce. That doesn't work anymore because people Everyone has, has access to information. There's far too much of it. And you can't rationalise that information unless you sit at the kitchen table. And some of the best experiences I've had have been when the public servants and the scientists say, well, we know some things. Can we come and sit at your tables and test those with you and you test your knowledge with us and collectively through joint jointly working together, we come up with solutions that are better than any one of the interests could have come up with. That, that's when people own the outcome, are able to deal with the winners and the losers, or the losers in particular, and that's when trust builds across communities, between states, across basins. But it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of resources. And it takes time. People often say to me, well, it takes too long to go and talk to all of those stakeholders. Well, if you don't take that time and talk to those stakeholders, it's probably going to take you twice as long to achieve the objective because you'll have to deal with the conflict on the way in, in some manner. So, yep, let's get around some kitchen tables no matter where we are, whether it's Nairobi or Adelaide, <coughs> Murray-Darling Basin, and talk about what really matters and recognise that this conversation and this journey is going to go on forever. There's no magic solution. And we need to stop surrounding ourselves with people in our own likeness that agree with us. It's comfortable to be in that space. It's comfortable to have people, everyone, that you're associating with agreeing with your point of view. But as the, as the last slide says, we have to reach outside our comfort zone and we have to walk in others' shoes. And we have to really understand what it is that's driving them. Why are they thinking the way they are thinking? And how do we move from where we're thinking and they're thinking to where we can find a common, a common ground to move forward on? everyone is going to be unhappy in a reform process because if you get someone happy and someone really unhappy, you've got it wrong. The one thing about the Murray-Darling Basin that I've always said is really good is we've got everyone equally unhappy, so we must <laughs> be just about right in the, in the direction we're trying to go in. Um, and, you know, the winners and the losers are, are one thing, but then there's also not pandering to those who have more power. That, that is actually a, a very good um, reminder to ourselves that you know, um, anywhere, conversation is good, knowledge exchange is good. And I always like to plug that we, we, through IRF, provide opportunities like IRS for that knowledge to actually come out um, you know, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a pleasant way that, that we could challenge each other but still you know, um, accept our differences. Um, I would like to, I, I, I'm getting the little nod here that we're, we're, we're almost, not yet there, um, one of the components, or, or I would say, when you look at community engagement or community um, ownership or empowerment, is that sense of hope. 
I was listening to Walter. Um, do I go home depressed or do I go home with a drive? So it's about the sense of hope. So this four, right? We talked about competence, the sense of the need for competence. Then we talked about the, the need for self-worth, so from a community perspective. But there is also what we call is the sense of hope. And I would like to hear from our panel members now and of course from our keynote speakers, time is of the essence. I mean, Colleen talked about the overwhelming. Um, sometimes it can be so overwhelming. And it's good. Overwhelming sometimes is good. But sometimes, you know, when you, when you have so much problem, we just kind of think, oh, where do I start? Um, so so there's, there's, a, there's a tension there in terms of how we address the global challenge that we are facing now. Um, so for each of the panel members and the keynote speakers, I would like to ask, in your own area, how do you instill that sense of hope in our community? <laughs> Sorry. Eva, you will know I'm the eternal optimist. Um, no, I think the uh, look the the I think the real optimism is this: is that the path forward is clearly one where people need to break down those barriers, build those relationships, and one of the things that I've seen. Um, in terms of you know how do you get it science and you know how do you get that out to the broader community how do you um, you know use that to try and guide and influence policy is really about building those relationships um, we used to do that a lot in Australia um, ten years ago you know we had schemes and funding schemes that really facilitated that engagement the, the transaction costs are high but they are the most effective partnership type arrangements that um, can be brought to bear to solve these sorts of problems. So I think, you know, we, we beat ourselves up a little bit in Australia as saying, oh, we're all failing miserably. Um, that sort of approach to working in partnerships, community, science, policy, um, we do that a lot better than many parts of the world. And it's interesting when you go to other countries how disengaged the science sector is from the decision-making process and particularly the community. So, mm -hmm. so I'm not saying we do everything wonderfully here, but the optimism that I would have is that that does really work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and some of the most exciting science things that I've been involved with here in Southeast Queensland has been a good example. Um, some of the national programs that we've had in Australia, cooperative research um, centres, are where we've really made some significant gains in building those relationships. I think building trust is a really key one, um, and it's you know it, it's whether you're building trust with policymakers or with the community. Nothing's going to advance unless we're really you know keep, keep working hard at doing that. Thank you, Stuart. Brad. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think changing the narrative as well is an mm -hmm. opportunity. Infiltrating the system is what I've tried to do a few times, you know, and try and change it within. Mm. And I think if we, um, that narrative, you know, it's just making it normal because in, I suppose, in my perspective, you know, like growing up, doing science, learning about Australia's history and I didn't learn about my people, you know. So it's about giving that chance to, to change the narrative, you know. Like we saw the, I think one of the slides had the, you know, the triple bottom line, the traditional triple mm. bottom line. You know, in New Zealand, quadruple bottom line is normal. You know, that cultural sure. circle is there. Mm -hmm. Here in Australia, it never gets mentioned. So I suppose um, it, it's sort of changing the narrative, but also influencing the way, you know, Indigenous people need to take the space as well. You know, we, we have, we, we talked about leadership before, so it's, it's us entering that space mm -hmm. and being the voice, mm -hmm. you know, but we've got to have that opportunity to be that voice. And I'm, you know, I'm here uh, being a voice. And, you know, I can't speak for every Indigenous person in Australia. I'd be, you know, tarred and feathered. But I'd be... Um, I'm talk I can only talk for my, my community, you know, and my, my elders might, might give me permission to, to talk. So I can only talk for my community. But when I talk about science, you know, there, there's so much stuff that can make it, um, I think, better. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's... It's having... You know, it's starting young. It's having curricula that talks about Indigenous knowledge early, you know, from kindergarten all the way to, mm -hmm. to university degrees. It's, 
it's indigenizing the curricula. You know, that's a way of changing the narrative. You know, well, I think if we can enter that space and we can tell our stories, not everyone else telling our stories, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity there as well. And I think that sort of hope is there. Yeah. Um, you know, we need, we need, and obviously, you know, we need more Indigenous people taking that space as well. And, you know, that's a challenge for us. That's great. Thank you, Brad. Walter? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, going home depressed. <laughs> oh, we were doing uh, this for you. No, I'm just joking. Well, I, I take with me the story of uh, sit, am I sitting on the right table? And I think uh, I've done this over 30 years of my career. I tried to join those tables, and I've been big tables growing. And one of them I refer to the Danube uh, region and the Danube River Basin. We created this big table of ICPDR, or of our own association, IAWD, where we created smaller tables. We invited waterworks associations from 19 countries to discuss and solve problems which we uh, need to address jointly. And I see even huge and enormous big tables, and one of them, I would say, is the European Union, where 27 countries are sitting around. Only one is trying to leave at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> but they, they are sitting together, and they try to solve this complex political uh, problem. So we do have the tables. Uh, we do have the conversation. We do have an outcome. Again, if you, if you, if I take the European Union, what happened through my life was we have framework directives, we have guidelines created. Uh, they were put into legislation in these countries. They're creating an outcome. We have results which we can measure. So this is uh, where I'm. Uh, I can only reflect and say. Was I sitting on the right table, or would, would there have been a, a different opportunity for me? But uh, I take with me one thought from Maraban, uh, which was important for me, and it's really a takeaway. So that she was reminding us, do a little bit more of exploring. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a kind of, even which we, uh, when we created these tables and we have these formalized discussions, are we still ready to sink out of the box from, from our role as a water industry or a water supplier? Are we ready to do this? So I, I, I take this uh, as a takeaway for, uh, for me back to Europe, uh, saying exploring is an issue. It's, it's, it's time to do this and probably I find a, a new table uh, to join. Thank you, Walter. That's right. It was stop planning, can, um, start experimenting and exploring. Perfect. Fung. Um, uh, in the Mekong River, uh, when the dams uh, uh, were built, um, people, local community, are uh, very depressed, very disappointed, and they blame a lot uh, that the governments uh, don't do um, their job, are not successful in like uh, stopping the dams um, built. So um, that is, um, we, we, we are very um, concerned about that reaction from the local community. And um, even we have the evidence um, that uh, the dams may not uh, create any uh, crucial, any significant impacts on their community, but they still, that they don't trust they don't uh, believe that uh, evidence. They, 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 they say that no, the dams will impact a lot. Uh, that will, um, uh, we, uh, our lives will be um, poorer and poorer. The, our condition will be very, um, very um, worse and worse, etc. So um, we think that we have to reach them um, more, provide them more information provide them more um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the proof or evidence and show, showing them and let them better understand uh, about the situation. That is the job of the government. And the government needs uh, to work very closely, more closely with the scientists, with the experts, with the, uh, um, and also even with, with the media to, to make the, 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 the information go through 
and uh, in a way that more understandable to the community and let them more understand about the situation. And the other thing is uh, let the, the community uh, to be involved as early as possible mm -hmm. in, in the process and uh, to, 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 um, in order to um, uh, uh, take them um, uh, away of the worries of the uh, concern of the uh, scares uh, if their lives will be wor worsened and worsened uh, due to the development uh, in the basin. So uh, we think that is our job and the target is quite still far, far because uh, it's a lot of challenges for us. But I think we, the government need to, 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 to think that way, how to reach the local community in that way to make them uh, feel um, uh, more comfort and not so worry much about the development. Yeah. Thanks, Fong. Can I ask um, Carleen and Lee to also address that? We're the basin bookends, and we're eternally optimistic. Thank you. That is a fantastic close to this session. Can you please join me in thanking our panel members, Professor Stuart Bunn, Brad Moggridge, Walter Kling, Fong, and our amazing keynote speakers for today, Colleen and Lee, I am very humbled.